So welcome everyone to the NF Patients United webinar. Today's topic is the psychological impact of COVID-19 on the neurofibromatosis patient community. And we are very happy that we are joined tonight by Andre Riedmann. He's a neuropsychologist working at the Erasmus Medical Center in Rotterdam. And he has been involved in the clinical side, but also in the research side uh, of NF uh, for a long time. Uh, has published uh, numerous papers and books on, on, on this topic. So we have an absolute expert here. And like, like for all of us, uh, COVID-19 changed our lives drastically uh, in the last month uh, leading up to, to, to this webinar now. So it will be interesting to hear um, from, from his perspective uh, how COVID-19 changed our lives for in the meantime, but maybe also what will be the, the lessons learned. And I'm really looking forward also to the discussion with you afterwards. As we said, please type in your questions in the chat and turn your mic on mute while Andre is presenting. But later on, we're going to have a discussion where you can unmute yourself and also ask questions uh, in person. So thank you very much, Andre, for taking the time and being with us tonight. And uh, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, Klaas, for uh, organizing and, and planning this, uh, this meeting. You're doing a really good job in, uh, in uh, overseeing all Europe and uh, trying to serve all Europe, also with your uh, youth um, initiative you have uh, to do this uh, patient academy. So I like your, uh, I like your work as well. <laughs> and thank you for the um, kind introduction. Uh, it's always nice to start with these modest um, expectations. Uh, so... Uh, I have a little presentation uh, I made for you. I got some uh, questions of you in advance. Uh, so I will share my screen um, uh, in the beginning and afterwards, perhaps uh, in the meantime, you think of any questions and um, uh, afterwards you, can, uh, you could ask them. I think it's uh, good that I, um, uh, I start and end my presentation first before you uh, ask some additional questions because perhaps the answer is in the presentation already. Um, in the meantime, um, I'm, I'm working at this uh, outpatient clinic for uh, uh, child and adolescent psychiatry and psychology. So I see a lot of uh, children, adolescents, parents, uh, but also some adults with uh, neurofibromatosis. I, uh, with me, um, there is a colleague of me, which is uh, Sarah van Dijk, who uh, is a, a specialized nurse uh, joining um, our neuro-oncologist uh, who is uh, leading the uh, adult and of one department in our hospital. So if there are any questions that, um, welcome Karin, um, if there are any questions uh, concerning adults that I can't answer, uh, I'll try to consult her. Um, but she's kind of nervous, so <laughs> perhaps she'll uh, answer indirectly, doesn't matter. Um, so you ask some questions in advance uh, about how to talk about uh, COVID-19 with your child and how to deal with anxiety and stress. Uh, so that will be in my presentation, uh, which I'm going to share with you soon. Oh, yeah, that's one problem I already show all in. Here it is. Okay, can you see this presentation now? Yeah, I see some people nodding which is good. Uh, as I told you, I'm a healthcare psychologist working here in the Netherlands. Um, so there will be some differences if I tell you about the COVID-19 crisis or Corona crisis, whatever you would like to call it, um, because every country has got its own policy um, and, and um, some uh, countries are already opening up and in some countries uh, problems are still increasing. Uh, so I, I try to be careful about uh, in, in, uh, doing um, any kind of um, uh, things that are generalizable. So I'll, um, oops, okay. I'll, I'll first want to tell you that uh, although NF1 is a genetic disorder, and you probably know that being a person that, that dealt with uh, neurofibromatosis for a long time, um, it is, of course, a genetic disorder with some physical or a lot of physical effects. There's a big variation in that, but there's also a big variation in uh, other more psychosocial problems. Uh, you have this 
learning problems, social and emotional problems. And um, those problems can be really part of N of one day, can be regarded as being alongside um, N of one, but since a lot of these problems are much more frequent in, in N of one than they are in the normal population, in the population without N of one, that's what I mean. Um, uh, we do think that uh, the uh, N1 gene and, and this mutation and the effects of this mutation has a strong effect also on cognition and on social and emotional factors in, in your behavior. Um, of course, there are some general effects uh, of um, COVID-19 crisis on, on mental health. And the first thing you need to know, everybody needs to know that these feelings are re really very normal. Of course, it, perhaps they don't feel normal, especially when you already have some uh, psychological problems like uh, increased anxiety on top of uh, 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 depressive uh, uh, symptoms. Um, so that will feel as more stress than you are regularly used to. Um, a lot of people will be anxious and they don't want to become uh, ill or infected. Um, and as, as you could hear from the presentation that uh, Professor Legis uh, um, had a few weeks ago, um, there is only a small link uh, between the uh, uh, the extra risk people with NF1 have, um, and especially the ones that, that have chemotherapy are the ones that should be more cautious. And uh, he gave some really nice advice on, on this area. So I won't deal with the somatic, the, the more physical uh, consequences of uh, COVID-19, but um, I can imagine that uh, people are really anxious and they're a bit nervous when they get outside. Um, and being nervous is okay, but it becomes really a problem when it avoids you from getting outside. Um, some people I talk um, stayed the last nine or 10 weeks at home and they order their groceries and um, they're really anxious to get outside, even when there weren't very much people outside. So most of them I will recommend to try to find some time slot when there are not very many people on the streets. So um, you could get some outside air, you could get some movement, um, which will most of the time help to reduce stress. Um, some people who already feel a bit lonely or feel like they don't belong in some social groups, they could feel more um, excluded. Um, and uh, I know that this is something that some people, uh, especially when you can see anyone in your appearance, that you get the feeling you're judged by other people. And uh, now uh, during this crisis, of course, uh, some people have a cough or they have hay fever, uh, or you just swallow something the wrong way and you <coughs> need to cough. Everybody looks around and everybody, um, thinks that you're the one that needed to stay home. Um, another really real fear um, is being separated from especially the elderly people in your, in your family. And um, also the elderly will feel that they are left alone. And, and that's a real problem uh, in, in the Netherlands where um, uh, most people are not allowed to visit their grandfather or grandmother. Um, in the homes where uh, they need to stay. And so most homes try to, and hospitals try to organize some kind of uh, way that you could meet with your, with your family. But um, that is really something that, especially the people that are already um, uh, getting forgetful, they are having memory problems, they will be the ones that are really confused because they don't see their family that much anymore. Um, and the most frequent problems, I think, are, are that you couldn't do anything about this, that you're bored, that you're alone, um, and that will, together will make you more depressed. And um, uh, because we need uh, other people, we don't need isolation. Um, 
we need contact, we need to hug people, and that's something that's really hard this time. And um, uh, it's good to to know that that the the countries where uh, the hospitals are getting uh, less and less patients with uh, COVID-19, uh, those countries are really opening up and um, they're uh, more and more allowing people to join. Uh, but still, we have this policy with social distancing, uh, which in our country means one and a half meter, other countries have two meter, but um, that will also give you the feeling that you still don't get this real contact. Some people are really having a realistic fear of losing their job or not having uh, enough money to, to, uh, to get around in, in, in the month. And um, that's also something that really um, gets you more and more stressed. And um, people will be anxious that their child is not getting enough attention from their teachers and that they will, uh, they will get behind in, in school, especially the parents of children with learning problems will, will really worry. Uh, but yeah, um, it's good to think um, then to realize that uh, all children will have this lag, all children will miss um, several months of education um, and uh, your child with or without any learning problems won't be the only one that's lagging behind and needs some more uh, attention. Um, there is a nice information source, source from the Canadian government. You can click on this link when I have sent this presentation around. Uh, I already told class that I will make a PDF of this presentation. Uh, there's, there will be more links following. So you can click on them if you, if you get them by mail or um, in some kind of other way. I don't know how class is going to share them. Um, there's not very much research being done on the mental health effects of this uh, pandemic. Uh, Klaas sent me a really nice questionnaire study um, he found uh, this week uh, where they asked and one patients what they thought. Um, I think the results really resemble what, what I just told you and what I'm going to tell you, uh, but we will um, add this link also to this presentation. Um, there is a really big study coming from China, not really surprisingly, of course, where we can see that especially adolescents are the ones that are really touched by this uh, pandemic um, even more than most uh, adults and you can see that especially depression and anxiety it has been increased uh, we already know that is these percentages are higher in people with nf1 but uh, these these are really sky high these percentages which means that there's a lot of people coming to uh, our departments to find healthcare. And um, to tell you from my own practice, um, uh, some parents and children, they come every month, for instance, when there are learning or behavioral problems to get some guidance from us. Um, but now during this period, especially the ones with ADHD or autism are the ones that are coming more and more frequently. So they're coming every week or every two weeks uh, just to discuss how to deal with this increase in, in behavioral problems at home. So now towards more the solution part because the first part won't have, wouldn't have made you happy because uh, that's all problems, problems, problems. And um, these are some ideas that our National Institute of uh, Youth Healthcare has formulated. This is the top 10 of, of uh, recommendations. Um, and the first advice that they uh, give is to ask questions. So you don't need to uh, wait till your child starts the discussion. Um, you could be the one as a parent to open, uh, just to ask them, well, what, what do you think about washing your hands so very often every day? Or what do you think that we can't uh, cuddle with grandma because otherwise she perhaps will get, will get ill? So those are really uh, questions that we can think of. And if we can think of them, a lot of children will, will think of them as well. Um, the double protection I uh, mentioned after this 
is that um, we find that both parents and children uh, are sometimes anxious that the other, so children think that parents will get worried if they ask questions, but parents also worry uh, uh, about their children. So parents are trying to protect children and children are, to protect, are trying to protect their parents, uh, which doesn't work if you add them both, if you, uh, if you let your behavior be controlled by these, these thoughts. And um, the best thing to break up this, this cycle is, is just to start with a question. Um, some parents have trouble to, um, to tell children that hard information about this, this uh, crisis, uh, because, well, it's not nice to tell um, uh, children that there's a possibility that people can die or people can really, really be ill. Um, but otherwise, if we don't tell them anything about this, they will keep on worrying and their fantasy will lead them towards perhaps some kind of horror scenario, which is worse than reality. So it's good to be honest. It's also good to keep your answers very briefly, um, not to, to uh, use very difficult words, of course, but you know that because uh, this is uh, towards parents and teachers I'm, I'm talking to. Um, uh, you need to explain why things are different, why we wash your hands, why there's social different, uh, uh, distancing, why you can't visit some people, uh, why there are also lines in the supermarket and all kinds of regulations and all kinds of traffic signs. Um, and all these signs and all these regulations tell you what to do. And, and that helps because uh, otherwise people who can't get any guidance, children that can't uh, hear what they can do, uh, they will get really insecure and they will um, uh, be happier when they know what to do, like washing their hands, like uh, helping sometimes with cleaning, like um, uh, helping uh, uh, to stay at home when your, uh, your parents are uh, going to the shop and you can't come with them. So those are, are things that we expect and we, we hope that our children can manage with. Um, Sometimes people are really relieved that children ask a question or that you had this little talk about Corona and you think, well, that's it. Uh, but it's really necessary to keep talking about this and to uh, try to uh, start up this conversation, especially when your child has got the tendency to be very silent or, or more silent than, than normally. Um, some children really, um, Behavioral, behavioral. I mean, um, show some uh, changes in their behavior. They get more active, more hyperactive. Some get really silent. Uh, some children are a bit grumpy or irritable, um, and those are important changes to address and to see. Well, do you feel? I can see that you feel different. Is there something going on, or is there something that I should know? There's those would be good questions to ask. Um, it's also good to give children language for their feelings. Uh, of course, the most basic words like angry or sad, they will know, but uh, things like irritable, the, the sometimes harder words are the ones that perhaps touch more of the feelings that they really have at that moment. And it's good for children to have these words so they can give more, um, detail to, to what they're feeling. Um, children hear more than you think, which means when parents or adults in general are talking about this crisis or talking about uh, people they know that are perhaps very ill, um, just realize yourself that they can hear a lot, even when they're in, in, in a different room. We have this saying in the Netherlands, and I think there is some kind of parallel saying which says that small uh, small pots have big ears so we know that children hear more than we than we think and if you want to end this talk always try to end it with what we can do and also with a perspective that this will end there will be an end to this this crisis it could take a long time it could be a long time waiting but um it's good to know that there will be an end of this crisis as well and also there are positive uh 
sides of this crisis. Perhaps you don't need to go to school, perhaps you uh, can play more at home. Uh, there's also more positive things to say about this, this crisis. Then one of the last things, last slides, uh, because the next slide will be one with especially a lot of links to follow, is how to take care of your mental well-being. Um, it's good to stay informed, but um, it's good also to try to regulate this really big stream of information. Um, there will be a lot of internet hits and they won't be all very uh, child-friendly, of course and uh, some of them will tell you repeatedly the same news in different words. So it's good to set some boundaries for yourself to say, well, I'm going to read the paper today and perhaps I'm going to see the news for once, but not anymore because we will know that it will be filled with COVID-19 news. Um, to stay connected um, next to this physical distancing is, is something we're getting very creative in. Then again, um, some people don't have the right computer, we found out, so we can, uh, as healthcare providers, we can think we can communicate with Teams or with Zoom or with any other kind of media, but um, I think some people really need some help in IT because they don't know how to get connected. Uh, those will be the ones that we really need to phone because um, about 98% of the most people have a telephone, um, which is for some people really old fashioned because they are used to WhatsApp or other kind of media. Um, but I think we need to return to the phone more and more when people are older or when they are not that really proficient in dealing with IT, with computers. Um, so talking will help you. Uh, it's not uh, only the talking, it's also what that people are listening, which is important to reduce uh, stress. And um, it, it, it's uh, most of the time we feel that that uh, feelings of stress are reduced when people just tell the other people that they are more and more stressed. Well, mindfulness is is one of the ways to deal with stress nowadays, and mindfulness has already come out of the. Uh, Kumbaya range. It's not really that kind of alternative medicine anymore uh, because we know that a lot of techniques for mindfulness help and, and uh, they can um, make people deal with stress much, much better. Um, some kind of breathing exercises, stretching or meditation uh, exercises are incorporated in, in mindfulness courses or mindfulness websites. And there's a lot of free material uh, online and I, I gave a few uh, links on the next slide uh, which will, will give you some information about breathing exercises. Uh, there are some uh, relaxed stories for children to read for them because before they go to sleep. Uh, there are some exercises you can do which are very short um, and if I say take deep, take deep breaths that's, that's something with really big science behind it because we already found also neurophysiologically, so we can see that in your heartbeat, we can see that in, in the amount of, uh, that people uh, express their stress with their bodies, that only one deep uh, breathing in and one breathing out uh, has got a big effect on stress hormones. So taking several ones after each other only for one minute uh, will will probably help you to to release some stress. Um, we already know about the uh, Corona kilos. Uh, the uh, people are uh, who, who deal with with increasing weight um, and and uh, these very really basic things like eating and sleeping are are the ones that we need some bit some more attention um, this period than they did before. Um, of course, there is some extra time for a lot of people, uh, so there's more flexibility, which could be a problem, especially when you have a child that has uh, behaviors in the autistic spectrum, because flexibility is not really their strength. Uh, so we need to tell them that things are different, but we all can also tell them very lightly that uh, it's okay to have some extra time. It's okay to 
um, to change your program as long as you know it in advance. To focus on the, the positive act, uh, aspects of your life, that sounds really simple, uh, but still there are a lot of things uh, that you can control next to the crisis, which you cannot control at all, of course. And it's good to, to stress also to children and, and other people that there's a lot we cannot control. Um, and, and that means that we need to bear this weight of this, this message and of this, of this crisis. Um, and we just need to wait uh, and, and try to uh, make the best of it um, during this, this period. Be kind and compassionate, which is a really open door, but um, I see people getting more and more impatient, especially when they're not keeping to the regulations, when they come too close, when they uh, cough on the street, when they spit on the street. I saw a man doing this this morning, but well, um, in most uh, opportunities, it's okay just to notice it, but not to say anything about it, just to ignore it and just to go through, just to continue your life without paying very much attention because there will be a lot of people that break these rules. And um, then again, um, in, in a lot of countries, more than half of the people and sometimes even 70 to 90% of the people are keeping themselves to the regulations. So, so it's especially the ones that don't uh, um, answer to these regulations, those are the ones that stand out. Um, but it's good to know that the majority of the people are really aware of social distancing and all the other uses and, and rules we have now, and, and they will keep to it. Um, then about substance abuse, a lot of you will say, well, I don't use any drugs, but uh, alcohol is the most frequent uh, uh, used drug. And there's a lot of people that really want to comfort them using uh, alcohol. And it's good to not to just finish it, but uh, at least to know how many are you going to take, how much you're going to smoke when you smoke. Um, just think about reasons why you would like uh, to stop is, is, is better than trying to stop now in this period where stress is really high. So I already told you that uh, there's a lot of links uh, telling you something about uh, relaxation and uh, giving you opportunities to uh, get the stress down. And now I'll finish this presentation now because perhaps there are already some other questions. Thank you very much, Andre. Uh, so in the chats for now, there's no new questions, but we have a couple of people that joined the call just recently some. And um, so I would like to open the floor. So anybody of you can unmute their microphones now and uh, can ask any question they might have. Yeah, hello. Hi. Can you, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for this presentation. I think it comes really timely because people sometimes um, underestimate the importance of uh, caring about their mental well-being. Normally, they only start thinking the, the, about this later when the problem is already there. So thank you so much. Actually, I have a plenty of questions. I will start with just one probably. And if, uh, if we have time, I will answer uh, the rest. So one of my questions um, concerns excessive talking, uh, because you've been explaining that it's really important to talk to kids, not to only the chance to, to discuss the problem, to let them explain their feelings, express their feelings and um, their fears probably. But what if a kid uh, gets constantly obsessed with the idea of COVID because he's exchanging, let's say, something by WhatsApp with his friends? and he's getting too much information, getting overexcited, and it means that he's some, somehow eating a lot of your time. And this means um, time burden for adults as well. So how to deal with this excessive talking, with this obsession of this topic, uh, constantly talking about victims, um, probably deaths, um, just discussing this issue constantly. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for this question. Um, Um, if this 
talking is, is a self, uh, more obsessive. Do you mean that this child is also asking a lot of questions or just telling what he heard? Both, both yeah. options. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so one of the things that, that could be going on is uh, that this is some kind of, we, we call that disinhibition, which means that you can't stop your behavior. Um, especially children with attention problems and children with ADHD have these problems. And, and as you perhaps know, that more than half of the people with NF1 uh, have these attention problems. And it's really hard for them to stop. So they need some kind of external break, uh, which are mostly the parents, uh, to help them stop. Um, and even when children are not um, uh, having ADHD or a background in attentional problems, um, could be uh, that this is some kind of way to express uh, anxiety because um, it's a way to, to control your feelings, just to say uh, what you have just heard, just to check what other people say. But then again, some children just talk without um, uh, waiting for any kind of answer. Um, in that case, especially when, when they talk, uh, you could try to, to limit the amount of talking. Um, first thing would be to say, okay, you had a lot, you, you, you experienced a lot today or you've seen a lot on the news or on the internet and, and um, now I'll listen for you for a little while. I'll only give you one more minute and then we'll finish and we're going to do something else. So there's always three steps in these kinds of reactions. The first thing is just to say what the behavior is and to address what kind of emotion could be underlying. It could also be that you can say, well, I, I noticed that you've been shocked about this news and or I could it be that that you were a bit anxious that it was ha this would happen to us or to grandpa or to you. Um, so just address the emotion and, and the fact that this is perhaps a bit excessive. So you can say you're talking really a lot and, and I do want to wait and listen to you, but not endlessly. So <laughs> there is some kind of limit. And uh, so the third thing will be that you say then um, in some kind of time units, uh, you need to stop, you need to final uh, finalize your, your talk. But the last thing you need to do is to shift the attention towards something else. So only asking them to stop is not enough. Um, it's good that in the minutes that you let them finish, you think about what next, what could be some kind of activity this child could, could try to do. So stopping is okay, and it's good to set the, the boundaries very uh, clear. It's, it's not okay to, to cut uh, their sentences in half, just wait till the sentence ended, and then just try to say that the child needs to end. Um, and also when there's a lot of repetition in it, some children, for instance, with, uh, with mental disabilities will, um, will have this tendency to, to repeat uh, over and over the same question. Uh, then at that time you can tell them, well, I already answered this question. Do you still know the answer? Did you remember what I told you about this? And you can only do that once because the second or third time you say, well, I already answered this one. So either you have a new question or now we're going outside to see if there's any other children in the playground. Just think about what to do um, afterwards instead of the talking. Is that an answer? Yeah, sure. Thank you. And you said that there are perhaps more questions. Yes, I would also have a question uh, because um, COVID-19 really affected every aspect of our lives, including our business lives. So for some people, working from home was a total new experience and, and having a home office and maybe small kids that are not at school and being interrupting you while you have stressful things to do at work and you wouldn't like to put them in front of, and, and park them in front of the TV for the whole day. Um, do you have some, some advice for, for structuring the day, making quality time with the family as well as being productive in work? Uh, yeah, that would be my question. Yeah. 
Yeah, nice question as well. Structuring the D. There, there's a lot of time schedules visualized on the internet. You can find a lot of them, but most of them are really packed. Um, so sometimes there are even 10 or 20 items to do every day. And I think most of these um, uh, day schedules are um, too busy. And what you need to think about is that uh, the younger the child, the, the, the shorter the period uh, the child can oversee. Um, so really small children like the, the toddlers and the kindergarten children that can talk and listen, um, they need only to know what will be the next activity. So for them, it won't really be helpful to give them some kind of schedule over the whole day. But one exception, if there's something really good going to happen, or there's something that they really need to know in advance, for instance, if you're going to some kind of healthcare practitioner, uh, if you have some time, uh, or if you uh, need to leave uh, um, them uh, alone or with, with, with someone else for a while, they need to know that in advance. But uh, younger children need um, less steps, and the older the child gets, uh, the more time it can oversee. And for instance, children of, let's say six to eight years old, they can, all, they, they can oversee the time period of, of, of one part of the day, like the morning or the afternoon. Um, and also for them, it's nice to know that if, if there are big things going on this day, that you know that this is going to happen anyway. But the small things, if you want to schedule that, um, you only need steps for of, of let's say one hour uh, maximum, which, which leaves us with about four or five steps for, for one morning or one afternoon. Um, so it's good to have something to look forward to. Um, and, and you really need to be sure that that is going to happen. And don't use that as kind of punishment because um, that will give a very negative feeling to this time scheduling. Um, and for uh, adolescents, uh, you can make schedules uh, with them and also with, for children from eight, nine year, years old, um, uh, they will uh, really like to think with you what the, the um, activities of the day will be. And, and, and it's good to um, just uh, use some rules. And one nice rule I think w is, is very important is that um, you can uh, admit to, to, to do some passive activities, so activities without movement. But if you do, if you put them in the schedule, um, you can say that uh, after any passive activity, there needs to be an active activity. There needs to be some kind of movement. Um, so if there has been a half an hour with the tablet looking uh, movies, uh, there needs to be some um, uh, activity which uh, involves movement uh, outside the door or in the garden or in the streets or perhaps even in, in the house. Um, and uh, during this switching moment from the passive to the active activities and also backwards from the active to the passive activities, they sometimes need a bit of help. So they need to be started up. They need to need your help as a parent to especially make the switch and uh, perhaps uh, you can help them build something or start building this, this, this castle or something um, and then expect them to, to finish it or to go playing with it uh, without your help. Uh, but those are necessary moments to uh, be involved as, as, as a parent and you can't um, uh, continuously be, be working during those periods, of course. So that involves a lot of planning uh, because you have your meetings perhaps and you have your appointments uh, during that day, uh, which is very hard. So sometimes you really need to explain to your colleagues or uh, to your boss that um, um, you can't expect every uh, second to be active uh, during work when you have two or three children walking around. Thank you very much. Yeah, also exa um, exactly, and also because suddenly you're a teacher as well, right? You have to you yeah. have to support your kids doing yeah. the work at school. And concerning concerning that, um, the teacher is in the home. Um, I found some children 
uh, especially the ones that are known for, for inflexibility, um, they really need some involvement of teachers. So I, um, uh, I found that some children uh, didn't want to do any schoolwork. Even a, a girl from 16 years old, she didn't, didn't want to do anything of it. Um, so we asked the teachers um, of the 16 year old, they, she only needed one phone call uh, to make this uh, uh, appointments about her homework. But um, the, uh, especially the small children of six, seven, year, eight years old, um, some of them, I made appointments with teachers that they would call two, three, or some teachers even every day, every school day in advance, just to ask or just to say good morning and what are you going to do now? And uh, I just, uh, I know you have this, this little book with arithmetic and uh, where are you going to start? Which really helped the parent not to be the teacher. Um, so if we involve the teacher in, in giving the base, the, the, the first instruction, uh, after that, the children were okay with their parents as a teacher. Before that, uh, they didn't accept the parent as a teacher, but they did accept them as a co-teacher. I see. Thank you very much. Are there other questions? I do have a couple more, but I want to <laughs> give the others. I see a hand from Rina. Uh, yes, I oh, have yeah. a question. Uh, many children during the quarantine became very reserved and, intro and introverted. Uh, so after the confinement, they fear a lot to, to get in touch with other children and adults. Uh, how can we help them to socialize again after the quarantine? Yeah, very good question. Yeah, yeah there's, there's really a lot of extra behavior when they return back to school or back to, back to normal life. Some children now really hate school um, or um, they are really getting, uh, getting in trouble, um, starting to play. So uh, I really hope that, that most teachers are aware that, that this is going on and they um, sometimes need to realize that children, for instance, of, of eight years old, uh, need to be regarded as socially younger children uh, now because they're more awkward in, in making this contact. And, um, they don't really know what to expect, and especially the introverted ch children uh, are the ones at risk because they are the ones that already have experience with withdrawing and, and not getting this contact. So the, those are the ones that are very silent, but they need the most help. And of course, a lot of help will go towards the children with external, externalizing uh, problems because they are difficult. Um, but it's good to know as a parent and as a teacher that especially the introverted children, they need some help in, in starting up playing and uh, going with them to the playground. Even if you were not going uh, to the playground as a parent anymore for the last year, uh, just think of it as, as a bit uh, of, of a falling back in time and, um, uh, and, and start up like you would have done one or two years before. In, in social development. And most of the children will, um, will be more at ease when you're nearby, uh, when they know where you are. Uh, and sometimes you only just need to walk with them towards uh, where the other children are playing. And that, 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 uh, is, that's true for parents and for teachers. So there, there's more teacher power needed on, uh, on the school floors uh, outside. Okay, thank you. I have a question about um, the anxiety about special, specific, uh, sorry, specifically uh, related to their own disease and F. Um, the study of Eurotis, uh, I can post a link here in the chat that showed that uh, Within the European rare disease patient uh, community, eight out of 10 patients have experienced a discontinuation of their care, meaning no more doctor's appointments, no more checkups, etc. And so uh, for people with rare diseases who are chronically ill, 
and their regular checkups are extremely important so that you know problems can be detected early so if you are living with nf1 or your child is nf1 and you had for example your annual mri scheduled for march and now you don't even know by now when it's going to take place uh, so this also induces a lot of anxiety and fear because you are worried about maybe there's a tumor i don't feel it now my child doesn't complain about any symptoms but it can already be there so this might uh, just increase the already um, the, the, the fear and anxiety that is already there, right? By by yeah. this, yeah. So so um, I don't see any solution here, but uh, I think also because countries are dealing with it very differently, some countries are now quickly uh, easing up restrictions, etc. Uh, but in our case, in in Austria, for example. Due to the lockdown, there was a big lack of uh, postponed uh, um, checkups, MRI checkups, etc. So it will take time to, to uh, deal with this big lack. So I, I wouldn't be surprised if some patients only see their checkups being done by the end of the year or even early next year. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, and also to keep in mind what Eric Lee just told us a few weeks ago is that um, some people will think, well, I have my annual checkup, so perhaps I just need to, to, to skip this one, which is a really bad idea uh, because a lot of people need this annual uh, checkup. And, and it's good to, to organize your own care or to let people help you to organize your care just to see that you get your checkup anyway. And the moment that you made this appointment, that is when you did everything you could. And of course, when there are, as we call them, red flags, for instance, if you really think a tumor is growing, if you're really getting increased pain, um, then it's time to really express that to your healthcare providers to say, well, I need really soon to have a checkup because, and then you say that I think uh, this this tumor is growing or uh, i'm getting more and more pain in my back and um, uh, and pain of course is something very subjective um, uh, but then again it's something you really really needs to uh, take serious uh, when it's increasing in, in in nf1 that's a real red flag um, but the moment that you have organized that your care that's all you can do um, of course, it's 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 nerve-wracking to to uh, to uh, keep on waiting, but um, uh, it doesn't help you uh, to to be very conscious of the fact that it will last for one or two or three months that you will have this next checkup. Um, uh, it won't get the things worse, but uh, mentally, um, it's in fact a waste of time. And there's this new. Um, part of, of uh, behavioral therapy, we call it acceptance and commitment therapy, ACT, uh, which gives us as, as uh, healthcare providers, a lot of strategies to help people to deal with the, ch the things that they, they cannot change at all um, and that they can't influence. And just to uh, be able to wait and relax during waiting. So one of the things um, you could do when you think that perhaps there's something growing, but you're not sure, is to realize if I would have this feeling about three months ago, pre-corona, before this crisis, would I be also as anxious as I am now? Is it the same feeling that, um, or do I think that it is, um, increased pain or increased itch or increasing tumor growth? Um, would I be that nervous also three months ago? So that's one of the, the exercises you could, that you could do. And, 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 and it's a little consolation, of course, and, and um, um, I cannot do anything and we cannot do anything uh, with these waiting lists because they're really real. And, and I think uh, my colleagues uh, working both with children and adults uh, adults uh, will be having a really hard time to get through all these waiting lists uh, for, for the rest of the year. Thank you. Yeah, that was very good advice. Thank you. Um, 
Any other questions from our group here? Can I ask another question? Sure. Um, I had the question regarding probably the other side, uh, the other side of the spectrum, and um, specifically when we're talking about kids who are very indifferent to the problem, uh, meaning that they don't understand the importance of what's going on, they don't care. And I witnessed the case when the kid was asked um, directly, what is he thinking about this crisis? And he, and he said, nothing, can I please watch a movie? So is, does it make sense working um, in a direction of trying to break up this indifference and maybe explain uh, some basics and in order to make uh, children more compassionate about people that uh, are victims of COVID or it's better to leave the things as they are and just uh, limit yourself to explaining basic things about social distancing, washing hands. Um, yeah. So, so you got it, I think. Yeah, yeah, very good question. Uh, there are, of course, always a few children or perhaps even, even more than a few um, that are indifferent, um, especially the adolescents uh, will, will take uh, this attitude. Um, and for these, uh, children, we need uh, to have really concrete examples of uh, what would be the consequences of not respecting social distancing, what would be the consequences of not washing your hands uh, after you came home from the supermarket. Um, uh, so we just need to um, explain that very shortly because we know that there perhaps not really that motivated to hear our preaching. Um, so you just motivate very shortly why we expect different behavior from them, and why this is important. But next to that, um, well, um, you just want them to keep to the regulations that, that the government sets and, and that, that uh, um, all different kinds of institutions set us. Um, but we can't expect them to, to mourn or to, to uh, linger with the thoughts on uh, people that, that are dying or people that are, are ill. Um, of course, compassion is, is a very important social skill, and, uh, but some children uh, especially learn to, uh, to deal with other people when they realize that um, we need to do this in order to, to uh, take, uh, to, to assure us that other people will also, um, be compassionate with us, will be patient with us. If we are patient, other people will be patient, uh, when we have some kind of problem. So, um, these children, we really need to explain that, uh, you don't do it for nothing. Uh, there's a reason why these things are are happening or why these regulations are there. Um, but it's a pitfall, I think, to, to repeat too much in this because they will really shut down and, and they won't hear anything more. So keep short and, and just explain why we expect this. And, and, and that is just a regulation that needs to keep. Um, but um, we don't really need to, as I said, preach to these children um, uh, how they should feel or how they should think. Um, the acting, that is the part that we could try to influence as a parent. Thank you. I, I just heard today on the radio there, that there was a study being published about what would have happened if there were no lockdowns at all happening around the world. And, and they were calculating that if there were no lockdowns and if people wouldn't have changed their behavior, they uh, calculated that there will be millions uh, of people uh, who have have died, but it's uh, so so. I think yeah. that shows very clearly how important it was to to do this. But um, um, following uh, this thought, um, there has been a lot like like I can't recall any time where there was so much information about one topic in such a short period of time, and also very contradicting information. So um, uh, it was really confusing uh, also for well-educated people. So what do you believe now? What's true? Even the scientists were not in alignment. 
uh, all the time. And then you have health politicians who preach restrictions and who don't uh, wear a mask themselves, so who don't really follow their own advice. So I think uh, that's not a good role model. And, and now people are told, yeah, you can go back to normal and they are confused again because well, why did we take so much care and we're so cautious when now we can go back um, uh, outside and, 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 and et cetera, et cetera. So um, while the internet is, I think, very, has very good information, it also has very bad information that can, you know, lead you into a bubble of conspiracy theories. So <laughs> is there any advice on how and where to get uh, information from? Or do you think that people with NF1 might be more prone to, uh, to, to be misled? I don't know if, if the last question, I don't know, but mm -hmm. um, uh, you're right that there's a lot of contradicting information. And that is also because sometimes people forget to be modest about the things that we really know. Um, the real scientific approach would be that we know to differentiate facts from opinions. Um, and there are very few facts. There were especially in the beginning, there were very few facts. We didn't know whether social distancing would work. We didn't know whether wearing face masks would work. Uh, we didn't know anything about that. We weren't sure about anything. And it would have been good that to, to also express this and to say, well, uh, better safe than sorry. We're just keeping to this social distancing. We're keeping to this quarantine because we think this will be the way to go. And, um, at this moment, we're getting more and more information of the effects of all these, all these uh, measures. Uh, for instance, the difference between Sweden and other countries is a, a really painful uh, uh, thing to find that social uh, uh, distancing really works. Um, and, but it's really the hard way that the Swedes needed to, to find out this way. And um, concerning this, this, this distinction between facts and, and opinions, there are, of, of course, a lot of opinions about um, uh, what will work or what we think we will, will work. Uh, there's a lot of beliefs on, on what is the cause and where does it come from. But there's a lot of information that is not really sure, we're not sure about. And, and it would be nice that, that uh, next to uh, governments telling us what to do, the, that the scientists would really separate these two. That, the parts that we really are, are, are sure about, that we really know, that we have numbers about it, about, uh, for instance, the amount of people dying or the amount of people getting ill, um, next to all these opinions about what we might do on top of all the regulations. For instance, what we might use for alternative medication or what we might uh, eat to protect ourselves. Um, there's not really much proof not really many facts telling us what to do on top of that. Mm -hmm. And of course you can differ, differ if it's about opinions, but facts are not opinions. Facts are things that we know because we found out. Exactly, um, but there was also a lot of fake news and false facts being yeah. uh, distributed in, in, especially in social media and the internet. I yeah. think this is just very, very dangerous because it gives people a very wrong impression of the situation. Yeah. And, and it's very hard to check the sources exactly. uh, because a lot of times there aren't any sources. You don't know what the information comes from. And the safest thing is just to keep to like uh, uh, organizations like the World Health Organization or your, your local variety of this kind of uh, health um, uh, authority. Um, that is the safest thing to do. and and, and um, what we really need sometimes is a bit more trust in these, these organizations and um, uh, just to realize that those are people too that are, go, that are going back to their children, they're going back to their, or sometimes to their parents and um, they will have the same problems as we have. So it would be very strange if they would think about some kind of funny story about how to, how these stupid people that we are governing would uh, needs to 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 act. Exactly. We we once did a webinar in Austria about the information trap uh, internet, and we had a, a 
uh, a journalist uh, talk about how to differentiate between you know uh, good valid sources and misleading sources so maybe if you want to type into the chat if there will be some webinar that you would like also to to hear in english on a european level i can try to arrange for that as well um, are there other questions don't be shy it's your chance <laughs> Okay, I want to shy and yeah. ask my third question then. Um, probably we've heard some something about this. I, I got some answers to my question already, uh, probably somehow, but just a question regarding those uh, people with an app who also suffer from autism. And in case they're too obsessed with their routine activities, is there any tip on how to deal with that? Because of course, during the lockdown, it's pretty hard to follow the routine. And especially for some kids, um, on the other side of the autism spectrum, it's really hard to explain sometimes why uh, keeping routine is not possible at this point of time. Yeah, yeah, and that's hard uh, because when you, and, and could you give an example about this routine? Uh, for example, a kid comes to school and he's used to arrange uh, something in his uh, cupboard and then he's used to go to some exact place to sit down and then he just has, no possibility even to go to school on, on some day, uh, yeah. to, to, to which he was uh, learned for a long, long time. So first he's learned to go to school on certain days and then he's made to stay home on, 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 the, on the same days. Yeah. And, and um, your question is as to how to um, let these children deal with it or how to explain why the children can't perform this same routine? maybe about how to lessen their mental burden to make uh, them feel less, less uh, anxiety at this point of time. Yeah. I know, I know it's, a, it's really a hard question. It really depends on individual features. It cannot be just something you know, yeah, common well, for each person. Yeah, of course. And, and one general thing I can, I can say is that changes are hard for a lot of people and they're harder for people with autism. Uh, but then again, the inex unexpected changes are the hardest ones. So, especially as as parents or as as uh, as teachers, we need to look forward and to imagine what will be different for this day or for this week. Um, so we can talk about that in advance. So we can tell them, well, this Tuesday normally there is school. But today there's no school. And, and of course, I, I know that you don't feel good about that. And, and, and I know that, that you really want to go to school on, on these days, but um, there won't be any teachers for you. So no use going to school. So short explanation after this is going to happen. And, and we need to be very sure about this, not hesitant. So think about what you're going to say in advance and just to be sure about well, this is what is going to happen and this is what is not going to happen um only a short explanation and after that again what is going to happen what are we going to do instead of that yeah this is a good point thank you yeah yeah vanessa is that you do you would you like to ask a question I cannot hear you. I can't hear you very well. Can you maybe get closer to the microphone or, or it's... Oh, uh, hold on. I'm not very good at this, I'm afraid. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah we can hear you much better now. I just want to say thank you. It's been really interesting. I have no questions because everybody's answered them. But <laughs> oh, very good. Really thank you very much. Um, I don't know how to mute myself now. I'm not good at this. Oh, there it is. I do have a question. Yes, Maria. Um, I have uh, a question about uh, coming back to school in September. In, in our case, I have a, a son that's on the autism spectrum, and he he is uh, he has Asperger's. He he was diagnosed with Asperger, and he's been thriving and having a great time at home. So it's going to be a little bit 
difficult for me to convince him to go back to school. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and that will be only in September, so there's three more months to go now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, of course, yeah. Yes, and how old is your son? Um, he's 13. 13, okay. So we'll ha he will have some notion of time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's good to, um, every week for the next one or two months, just repeat that, oh, okay, well, now you still have three more months or two more months of, of holiday, but in September, we're going back to school again. And just to present it as something that really is going to happen, whether or not he's going to like it. And uh, don't do that every day for the next two months, but um, only the last week, um, that will be a week where every day you need to think, you need to say something like, well, now is Tuesday and next Tuesday you'll be in school again. So it's good to make some remark, not really to rub it in, but uh, just to um, make some really lighthearted remark about that this is what's going to happen. And, and perhaps then, we'll, then there will be some kind of reaction like, well, I don't totally feel about doing that. You can say, well, I can imagine because you really had a great time. Um, but still, that's going to happen. And there will be some advantages too. Um, so every time the child is saying one disadvantage of going to school, um, you need to think about one advantage, not 10 towards one, just only one. Just, but, well, you're going to see your friend again, or you, I know that you really like to do geometry and there's going to be geometry. Um, at least know about <laughs> what you could be looking forward to. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> Andre, do you think that the COVID-19 crisis will have a sustainable impact on the way uh, people are viewing, uh, you know, or, or, or um, valuing the health of oneself or the society? Because we never thought that anything like this would have been possible, that we shut down entire states and countries and 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 basically the whole public uh, public uh, uh, spaces um but i think that the whole world is now put in the shoes of for example a person with nf because we have all been faced with a invisible health threat where there is no cure it's the everyday life of people with nf do you think that might be an opportunity for us as a society to value health more and to show more solid solidarity to rare diseases like an F? Well, the last one, that's the hardest one. Yeah, because I do think there will be a lasting effect. We know that from, um, uh, from China, where they already had some um, diseases that are really resemble uh, Corona uh, virus before, um, like 10 years before they had to um, epidemics uh, and they did really change their behavior after that. And if behavior changes, you know that something inside is also changing. But regarding the generalization towards neurofibromatosis, well, that's a hard one because it's, I, I think it's kind of abstract to link these two to each other because uh, especially life and death is something that people really uh, makes them think about a disease and um, NF is, is a disorder. Uh, of course, it could be lethal, but really on the long term in the most uh, people. And uh, COVID-19 is a disease where you can really rapidly get into intensive care and, and die. So that's a really big difference between these two. Um, and I don't know if people will, will make this link about these two. Of course, I think that will be a new realization as to what is what is healthy for you and there will be new perspectives on on hygiene and and all uh, and and the washing your hands before going to dinner won't be the same as it was last year uh, because now we know why we do it and and uh, we do it even more often now and it's getting more and more automatized and we're really getting used to it um, but the last thing you said the 
put making the link toward NF1, I think I, I'm afraid that's a bit far fetched. I think that that we as healthcare providers and patients together, uh, we perhaps need to make this link uh, to say, well, sometimes I think the way you're feeling now, talking to a person that's really anxious, um, is the way that I feel constantly or uh, that I feel every week. There's a moment that I think this way and now you're thinking this way as well. So that's interesting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I don't think people will make this link by themselves. Yeah, I, I wouldn't believe that as well. I thought maybe if we do a really good campaign and can, uh, you know, make people think about this like that, like yeah. uh, that there's, there's similarity between, you know, um, being yeah. confronted with COVID and being confronted with another disease. Instead, we can protect ourselves like um, you're born with an F. It's not an infectious disease. There's many differences, but still there's a health threat and, and there's no cure yet or no, no effective treatment. Yeah. yeah, and, and yeah. I, to be honest, I think that this is going to be even more social stigma for people with physical conditions. And we can all see that people of certain races and countries have been, in, have been stigmatized because of being different of probably carrying some disease. And I think this will also concern people with some physical conditions. Uh, but on the other hand, yeah, maybe you're right. Maybe it's 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 just how you it's just how you you know like present this to others. But I, I think that unless we act, uh, then especially for people with an app who have some deformities, this could be the contrary. People will yeah. feel you know like a bit yeah, alienated you're right. from them. We also need to explain to more people that N1 is not contagious, for instance, uh, if, you, exactly. if, you, if you have these, these uh, symptoms that can be seen by other people, then we need to explain more and people will be perhaps more, uh, uh, they, they will have a tendency to, to be more assertive and to ask more questions about you and about your health condition. So, so we need to practice a bit about what are we going to say. I know in the Netherlands we have this this book with patient information with this nice uh, flow chart. Um, whether or not you're going to explain something to people to other people about having N of one, and and the, the different chase also between people that are really close by, like like the colleagues and and family, uh, or people that are more distant. To us and that really makes a big difference but we need to sometimes uh, um, practice the way we are going to explain very shortly to the uh, stranger people and very more elaborate to the the close by people uh, and we need to practice how to uh, explain what n of one is Exactly. Uh, uh, yeah, maybe it's a little bit off topic, but I think it's, a, it's also what we experience from, from our contact with uh, families who have a, an affected child is that some have a lot of troubles of, of communicating uh, uh, their, their, their disease and, and who want to keep it a secret for as long as possible, thinking that they might protect their child from, from something or wanting them to live a normal life when life is normal for them having an F1, right? It's, yeah. it's like, that's yeah. their normal life. Uh, but, different um, normal. Yeah, different normal, right, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, and I do spend some time with, with parents who are anxious to explaining or telling the child that, that he or she has an F1. And I do spend some time with, with practicing this. So, so how are you going to tell it? And what words are you going to use? And, and uh, how much time are you going to take for it? And what if, he asks, I mean, am I going to die? Or what if he asks, is it going to be uh, as bad as this man I just saw? Or yeah, all these questions, we need sometimes to, to prepare ourselves to these questions. And, and we can't prepare to everything, but uh, we just can try and to imagine what will be the next question. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Are there any other questions? about the presentation about the topic COVID-19 or other psychologically related NF questions? 
that you want to ask. Otherwise, I think after using already much more than one hour of Andre's time, we might slowly think about getting to an end, but still I uh, want to ask you if there's any last questions from your side. Okay. Okay, so um, then I would like to thank you all for joining, but especially thank you very much, Andre, for taking so much time and being with us tonight and, and, and explaining to us the many different dimensions that how COVID-19 affected our lives from a psychological point of view. It was very interesting to hear uh, your talk and thank you for answering all our questions and being thank so patient with us. And thanks and, for your preparation. And yeah, so um, for, for uh, just to sum, sum it up, we're going to prepare subtitles again. So we are working with our member associations so that we can provide the subtitles in different languages to the YouTube video. This will, going, this will take some time because it's a, a lot of work to transcript uh, 80, 90 minutes of, of talk, but we'll do our best to have it available soon. So thank you very much, everyone. And I wish you all already uh, a nice evening and, and, and a very nice uh, weekend. And yeah, hopefully see you all soon with one of our next webinars. Thank you for helpful insights. Thank you so much. And thank you for organizing this as well. Thank you.